the unit. There's a big black stripe on the side of the screen. <laughs> I hope that doesn't, I don't think that's going to cause any problems, but it does make my slides a little bit off-center. Um, so I'm Oliver Davis, um, OP Davis, mostly on the internet, on Drupal.org, GitHub, Twitter, etc. Uh, I'm a senior Drupal developer for a company called Atmovation. Um, I'm a core contributor, mental, contrib module maintainer, etc. So pretty active in the, in the Drupal space. Um, so let's start by asking this question. Um, why would you want to write tests? Uh, first thing is, you want to write better code. So essentially, you want to write code with less bugs, or ideally no bugs at all. TDD also means we can also write less code. So by writing, if you take the TDD approach, we write our tests first, tests first, we would only write enough code to satisfy the criteria for a test. So in most cases, that means a lot slimmer code base. Um, keep in mind, so if you've got a, a test suite and you write your module, you can be confident that because your tests are all green, your tests are all passing, if you didn't add more functionality or read back your system functionality, that you haven't broken, <laughs> broken anything, which is obviously quite a large piece of mind. Um, to ensure consistency, again, if we're adding functionality, refactoring, take, removing legacy code, we want to ensure that our results are the same. Um, and also, it's a Drupal 8 core requirement. So if people aren't familiar, there are a number of gates for Drupal 8 core development that need to be, need to essentially go through, hence the team gate, uh, in order for your code to be passing the core, um, one of which is automated testing. Uh, also, why not test? So that this, I think, is the main reason why you can, people nod in their heads. Um, the main reason why people don't do tests, I think, aside from maybe the knowledge gap of not knowing maybe how or, or what to do, uh, the, the main thing I hear is we don't have time to do tests. We don't have the budget to do tests. If I do a proposal for some work and I'm becoming an over budget, first thing, automated testing and accessibility are normally the two things to get taken out straight away. Um, also, if you've dedicated a task, let's say you have two hours to complete this task, you're on a time limit there, and you maybe don't have the time within that to write the test. Um, I'd sort of not argue, but try and quantify this a little bit to say that essentially you're investing time. So you may be spending a small amount of time initially, or an amount of time initially, with the intention of saving more time later on. So if we say something if we spend 10% of your budget doing time for testing, if that then saves 20% of time later on, that's a win, right? So I try to think of it in that perspective rather than we just don't have um, the budget all the time. Um, as I mentioned, there is a, a, a testing gate in, in call. Um, this is taken from the actual gates page on Drupal.org. Um, essentially says new features should be accompanied by automated tests. It's self-explanatory. Um, if the feature does not have an implementation, provide a test implementation. And bug fixes should be accompanied by changes to a test that demonstrate the bug. So if you're fixing a bug, you just essentially put a test in to show the bug is fixed and then what will come back. Um, that's the page it comes from. Um, Testing in Drupal. So there are potentially two ways we can do testing for this type of unit, functional testing in Drupal. Um, one is simple test. Um, so it's based on this testing framework, this library, um, from simultest.org. I don't know how, whether it's still used or whether it's outside of us. I think it's mainly Drupal, Drupal specific at this point. I might be wrong. Um, it's in D7 core. So there's a module there called simple test. I think the machine name is just testing, which is slightly confusing. Um, it's been around the contrib since forever, as far as I can tell. It's been there since maybe sort of Drupal 5, 6, 4, I think 4, I saw it in the, in the queue. Um, they use their own file extension, at least in Drupal, so they use star.test, essentially the PHP files, but they all have the .test extension. 
And what seems to be the convention is to have all your test classes in one file. So if you're writing a module, you can have one mymodule.test file, and you literally have um, classes <coughs> one after the other, all in a single file. Um, the other option you need to do is PHP init. Um, this is a standalone PHP testing framework. So it's used with other projects like Laravel and Symfony. Um, it is supported in Drupal 8 core, but it's not the default. So simple tests are still the default in Drupal 8, although there is a shift towards that I will get to in a moment. Um, they use the more standard .php file extension, and you tend to have one test class per file, one class per file. Um, So yeah, um, the project that I use, I do a, a project it's called the Drupal VM CLI, which I don't know if anybody has used. Um, it's a Symfony console application for generating config files for Drupal VM. Um, and recently I've got done the route of running PHP unit tests on Mac. So again, not Drupal specific, you can plug it to any PHP application. Um, there is a PHP unit initiative, Drupal initiative, official one. Um, this is the page, we can find out about it. And essentially, it's talking about moving Drupal 8 core tests to use PHP in it rather than simple test. So with the intention of sort of deprecating simple test and then removing it completely before we get to Drupal 9. Um, and I found an issue that referenced a big chunk of tests, um, which were due to be converted on the 21st of last month. I don't know whether that was the case, but that was the problem that turned out to find. Um, and this is some of the text from it. Um, yeah, so as I said, the 21st was the date they were going to convert some of the tests. Uh, but there is a backwards compatibility layer um, so that we could just pretty much change the base class that we're extending, so change it from um, Drupal web test case to use uh, the browser test case that PHP unit provides, or we'll the implementation of it. Um, and apparently there's also a script to automatically convert test files I have had to use it um, when I upgraded one module I maintain called Override Node Options to Drupal 8. It was initially going to be simple test um, in D8, and then I just moved it to PHP by just literally changing the base class. So I have had to use that. Yeah. Um, so developers are encouraged to use browser test base instead of simple test um, as of 8.3, so pretty much now. Um, but both systems will run in parallel for the duration of Drupal, <coughs> so essentially until Drupal 9. Um, I like this quote, the timeline for deprecation of simple tests is under discussion. So it's still going to be there for a for, for while. Um, types of tests, uh, so unit tests are the first ones we talked about. Um, essentially test PHP logic. So you have a function or a class, you give it this and you expect to get that back out. Um, no database interaction, so it's only testing the PHP is running. And because of this, they're very quick to run. There's very little overhead there. <coughs> um, the other option in this is web test. So when I mentioned web test base, this, this is the test we're referring to. Uh, and these are testing functionality. So they're actually in the background creating a brand new Drupal site based off the standard installation profile, re enabling the modules you tend to enable actually essentially clicking around behind the scenes, capturing the output of it and running tests against that. So because of that, it means it's having to interact with the database, but also means they're quite slow to run because these things take time compared to the PHP test where you don't have to do that. Um, so writing testable code, um, there's an idea, there's a principle called the single responsibility principle, which more applies to object-orientated code. I'm sort of abstracting it out to functional um, procedural PHP code. So essentially, it says that if you write in a class, the class only needs to do one thing. Um, so I'm therefore extending that to say if you're writing a function, the function should therefore also do one thing. Um, I've seen similar things where we've got a module with a preprocess hook, and maybe it's got a 400 line preprocess hook, where it's split that out into separate functions that say, do A, B, C, and D. Do those as separate functions that are responsible for their piece. A, it's more readable, and B, it's more testable, so you can test that piece of functionality in isolation. Um, 
dry, and don't repeat yourself. So rather than do the same thing multiple times, abstract it to its own function, abstract it to its own method in the class, we reuse it. Only have to test it in one place. Um, use dependency injection and code to interfaces. Fury and Tim's talk earlier talked a little bit about dependency injection. Um, this also means that if you have a dependency, you can use what are called mocks and stubs and say that if you're injecting service A, I can mock that and I can sort of imp you have not having to inject the entire thing, so it makes your test faster, but also um, yeah, also you can then test. You're not having to worry about how that works in your in your test, you're only worried how how you use it rather than actually what it does. Um, and then also you can if you're working with data, you can also mock your data you're passing into your tests as well. Um, as well as your configuration. Um, so test driven development or TDD. So this is the process. So you start off by writing your test first. So you don't write any functional code. Test first, then you run it. It's going to fail. It's going to be red. There's nothing there. So you maybe you're going to run a Drupal get on a page that doesn't exist. You're going to get some sort of 404, or you're going to do something that's going to fail. And that bit's quite important. If you write a test and the test passes straight away, you don't know how good that test is. So it's important to see it fail, first of all. You then write code until the test passes, only enough code that's needed to pass the test. You repeat, so keep going, keep adding more tests, keep writing more functionality. And then when your tests, when your tests are green, you can then refactor it because you know what you're doing is working and then you can change your code, you can refactor what you need to refactor, take away things that are not needed, but you still then got the knowledge that your tests were passing previously, so you know what you're doing is still working. I'm going to be factoring your test screen. So how do you start writing tests? These examples are very Drupal 7 specific just because that's what I've been doing lately. So in this case we've got a .info file because Drupal 7 and we're using the files square bracket syntax and telling it to load our example.test file. So this is only Drupal 7 specific because Drupal 8 you have it in its own class, it gets auto-loaded by the namespace. And then you, within your .test file, you ex write your own PHP class, you extend the base class that it needs, so in this case we're doing um, a web test, so an actual browser test. You could also be ex extending um, Drupal unit test case, we're doing unit tests. Um, and then the first thing we do is return a static method called get info, uh, and that you just return back an array very standard array, you give your, your test a name, uh, a description of what you're testing, and then a group. So you can group tests, you might have multiple, you're very likely to have multiple test suites. If you've got web tests and unit tests, for example, you put those into the same group and run them um, as a group. <coughs> um, following on from that, you start writing these methods. Um, methods are just functions. And you start them, this one just says test something. And because it starts with a test with a lowercase t at the beginning, simple test or PHP that knows it's a test. That's how it can tell. Um, and then within these, we can start running various assertions. An assertion is just a way of checking something. That's the right time to think of it. So this is probably the most simple test ever. Um, this is going to assert that true is true, which obviously we'd expect to pass. Um, one test method can have multiple assertions. So if you maybe testing if a page existed, you might check the response code first of all to check it's a 200 response and then check that the page title is X and the content is Y. So it doesn't have to be one code function. There we go. Yes. Um, there's also a setup method. So this is essentially we're saying what we're creating our world. That's the way I, I hear that recently. So we're saying, when we run our test, the tests essentially run, so to say, yeah, it starts off with a standard Drupal install behind the scenes. It stores a new version of the standard installation profile, nothing else. And in this situation, we need to tell it, essentially, what to install. So it, I believe it ignores the dependency, so I think you have to do this, even if you're specifically depending on a module. Um, and this is what the setter method is for. So we're gonna extend, sorry, override the setter method 
and then call its parent. You, you have to do that. Uh, we could either pass it, if it's maybe this module, we just pass it in as a string. Uh, if we're working on multiple modules, we just pass it in as an array, as you can see, using the short array syntax to do that. Um, and just anything else that's needed to run before each test method is run. Some of these things could be Drupal create user, if you need to have users installed. So all threaded options is a good example of this. So that essentially means users with a role of X see this checkbox below that checkbox, or this uh, this um, input field for maybe the author or the others. So we can create users and you pass them an array of permissions. So who's the right to do what? Um, Drupal login, very standard, logs in your user account, pass your account into it and it will log them in. Um, Drupal create node, creates nodes, um, yeah, just pass it, pass it array, which node type you want, which field, managing, etc. Drupal log out, obviously logs people out. Um, there's various other things we can do in there. These are the most common ones I sort of want to use. Uh, and then we can start adding assertions. There's quite a long link there, off to the Drupal API documentation. Um, so these ones are fairly standard. We can do things like assert true and false. No and not null, equal. There is also one for not equal. Most things tend to be positive and negative, so you can say it's true or not true. It matches or it doesn't match. Um, we can also assert the raw text. So rather than the visible text on a page, we can actually dive into the HTML code behind it and say, does the HTML include a div with this class or something with this ID? Uh, if we want to assert the response code, we'll say we get a 200 response for, a, for an OK. We can use the assert response. Um, assert field, field ID, is very Drupal specific. So again, Open Options uses these quite a lot. Just to say, is the field, if somebody has a permission to change the author, we can use the assert field or not assert, assert not field. See, does this user, is this user able to see this checkbox or this option? Um, and also, yeah, so title, just to just compare against the, the page title. And how do we actually then start running tests? Um, so we can do it through the UI, that's first of all. Um, if we have the simple test module enabled, you can go to um, the configuration screen, there's an option there for testing, and we start seeing this whole list of all the test methods that are defined by each module, so they, they're grouped by the group that we saw originally, uh, so you can click these and see, see them all. Um, check the box at the bottom of the bot uh, button at the bottom of the form. Um, we click to run them. Um, we see something like this, so depend, obviously depending on what we're running. Um, run through each of the tasks, and you start seeing <coughs> feedback across the bottom. So it's showing you feedback for each task that is run how many um, passes and how many exceptions and so how many debug messages there are. And at the end, you get something like this. Um, so you can take it back to maybe the, the not, not the list page, but the list of tests within what you've run. You see a little summary that shows you how long the tests take to run. This one took two minutes and 19 seconds. We think we added the menu module. Um, and then again, you can split down each of these lists, you can see exactly what what's run. So this is what we want to see. We want to see green. Um, we see a bit more description about what we've got. So which group the test is in, which file ran it, uh, what line it's on, and even what function or what method um, is being run. Uh, and also we can see, and I'll give you an example of this one, but that the I think it's the verbose message, or there's a link you can click that actually loads up the site or screenshots of the site that it ran. So if you're trying to debug a test, you can either export it with flat files on disk, or you can actually do it this way and sort of browse around the site and go step by step and see what the output was. So that's quite useful for, um, for debugging. The way I prefer to do it is from a command line. Um, so in there's a, a run-test.sh, so it's a, a bash script file, although it's PHP. Um, so for Drupal 7, we can just run PHP scripts.sh. Um, for Drupal 8, it's just sits within the core directory, so just run the same thing, PHP core scripts.sh. 
uh, we can pass through various options. So if we want our reference to have color, we can see dash color. Uh, we can give the bogues output. Uh, we can run tests, like all tests, or tests within a certain module, or tests within a certain class, or a certain file. Um, doing PHP unit testing. Um, cool will come with a file called PHP unit <coughs> XML. And we set some of these options for you, things like colors and which directories to roll them. Um, or we can just run it by running PHP unit. So although that does assume you've got the global executable installed, if you're running something like the Drupal Composer project, that will include PHP unit as a dependency, in which case it might be vendor bin PHP unit if you don't have that included in your path. Um, I have vendor bin in my path, so I can just run PHP unit from the root directory. Um, so again, we can just run PHP unit and run everything. We can tell it a specific, specific directory. So if we want, only want to run maybe a certain module or a certain file within a module, um, or if we only want to run one specific test method, we can use dash as filter and then just give it the name of that method to run, and it will just run that one particular, that particular thing. So that's how to do it. Um, I've got a couple of examples to look at. So there's a module I wrote quite recently called the collection class module. Um, this is it, collection underscore class. Um, and it adds, if anyone's familiar or has used Laravel, that uses collection classes quite extensively. Um, and essentially, rather than returning back an array, it returns back a collection with collection items. So it provides various helper methods, essentially, for those items. So rather than having to run things like array map on an array, you then get an, a map method on the, on the collection. Um, sort of like this, actually. <laughs> so, um, Again, inspired by the way Laravel was doing this, I've made a collect function, just a global function, which you can pass an array into, um, and then we can start running methods off that. So all return back just the items in the array. Um, count returns back the count, and the keys return back the keys of the array rather than the values, for an example. It just, again, wrappers around mostly the array, the array function. Um, this is part of at least the, the collection <coughs> class itself. So it's, um, it's a collection class. We are using my Amazon view Xcode load module, if anyone's familiar with that. So it does live within a Drupal underscore collection class namespace just to provide it and to prevent any um, class name collisions because collection is fairly generic. Um, we're implementing a few interfaces, but I don't to worry too much about that. Um, pass to our pass through our items, and depending on whether we're passing through it as an array or another collection, it does slightly different things. Um, and from there, we can start running methods on it. So um, it's a string, we'll return it back as, as a JSON array. Um, we can do things again like all count first, to return back the first item. Um, we can run tests um, or conditionals and say, is this thing empty? So essentially, we're saying running that on the empty object, so. Um, so, so some tests for this. This one was built fully TDD up front. So within the setup method, we're gonna make two collections. Um, the first one's gonna pass through three strings. Uh, the second one is more of a, a multi-dimensional thing. So we just pass it back an array of arrays. Uh, and each array has a title and a status. So these are primarily used for using array filter filter out the ones with zero value. I'm not sure if that's an example, but that's what they're there for. Um, and again, we just want to make sure we run the parent setup method. Anytime we, if you extend a class and then you make a method with the same name, in most cases, you want to extend, you know, make sure you run the parent. Um, it's true for constructors and also true for this particular setup method. Um, and then we start doing things like this. So we're going to test the collect function. So that global function we call collect. Um, we basically assert that it's equal to. Um, we're going to get the class for the first collection, and then that should be, again, because it's using the XFOLTO module to give it the namespace, that should be equal to Drupal slash collection underscore class slash collection. So XFOLTO, those of who's not aware, provides Drupal 8 um, namespacing and auto-loading. So the same way that Drupal 8 
in most classes, X-Autoload does the Drupal setting. So you can use like PSR0, PSR4, autoloading or Drupal setting essentially. Um, so that's, that's why it's Drupal slash module name collection. So that's just testing that. Um, we can test all. So all returns back essentially the values of the array. So in this case, we can use insert equal to do that. And what we're expected to happen is if I get the first collection, so because it was in the setup method and assigned to a property, I can get the first collection by doing this first collection. We can run the all method on it, and we're just basically saying that should be returning an array, foo bar, or bounce, because that's what we pass into it. We can do test count. So we know we expected three items in the array. We can test if that's still the case. <coughs> Might as well test all the way. Um, test merge, so there's the opportunity to merge two collections. So in this case, we've got a collection A, B, and C, <coughs> and then the collection of D and F. When you merge, essentially you run the main array merge on the two, put them together. So in this case, we're saying that we take the first collection, the merge of the second collection, and then get the result back out again. This should combine the two values together, so the resulting should be A, B, C, D, and F. And so that we can do that. So this actually says at the top of test test run ran in zero seconds. So it's gone through, um, let's see, 22 passes, zero fails in zero seconds. So because these are all, we're only testing PHP logic. We're only saying that given this class, I'm going to give it this array and expect this back out again. We're not doing any database actual, we're essentially not touching Drupal at all. All we're doing is testing that function, so it's super duper quick. And again, yeah, you can see these are the tests that are being run. You get this type of output, and you can don't specify a message, so you can do things like assert equal, um, A and B, and then if you do that, then that's fine, and it uses these fairly standard messages, or you can pass your own message in. I think <coughs> these are just using mostly the default ones. And yeah, so this was completely module. All it does is plays a wrap around this thing, fully um, activity-driven, to test only. Um, another example we can look at is another module I did called Total Optional Fields. Um, make an idea what it does by the picture. Um, so again, it's a new module on Drupal.org, toggle and swap optional fields. And so it's going to add the button to the top of the logo board that says show optional fields. So this came from one of our client projects um, we did fairly recently. And it's quite a long node form and we just wanted to see I think they just said they wanted a shorter node form. That was the requirement. And then I decided what we'll do is we'll just show the required ones initially and then re add the optional ones later if they click the button to do so. It says you did this using four models essentially and some hook real access. Um, there is an alter hook. So I assume it happens quite a lot with clients. This was our initial scope. And then they said, oh, actually, we want this field that's not mandatory. Optional, this optional field to be shown, even though it's not, <laughs> even though it's not required. So, in this particular case, there's um, an alter hook within the module that we can do from another module. Um, so, hook toggle optional fields we can use, um, and this one uses the mixture of unit and web tests. So, in this example, um, we're, we're looping through the available elements out of the form, and there's a function that we run that says, "Is this?" field element. So we pass it the element name, and then if it's not, it just returns early, otherwise it carries on down the chain. Um, stores the element, form element as an array by reference, so we can modify it. And then if the particular element is in our overridden fields list, uh, we're going to check its access value. And then otherwise, we're going to check. Yeah, again, the access is right. Access value or, uh, yeah, or methods. So it feels not required to slow access to hide it. So, so the override hook means that we can actually say whether things are true or false. So it's going to return back that's true or bad. So in this example, what do we want to test? So functionally, we're going to test are all the correct fields shown and hidden? And we can unit test then to check whether the field names return back the correct results. So the very first thing that we showed is this, 
drills, then that's, that's even test. That's perfectly fine. Um, so this is the function that we're going to test. So we pass in the element name. And essentially, we're going to say that if it's a body or it's a language, it's a field. Um, otherwise, we're going to do a substring based on the name. And we're going to get the first six characters. And if it's equal to field underscore, it's a field. So if I do a bit of testing this, um, we can use the set true for most of it. And we can pass it in, in this case, field underscore tags. So because it starts with field underscore, expect them to be true. And likewise for body, because we add that, that will happen slightly later. Um, we can verify that that still passes, even though it doesn't start with field underscore. And then we can also test that the opposite is true. So we're testing that we're giving it a value that should which are false in this case. So the title is A not a field and B is false. So it's not start with a field underscore, so it's not a field, but it's not within our exception um, exception is probably the right word list. So um, and this is what we get. So three passes in again zero seconds, because unit tests, no need to touch the database at all. Passing the method name, element name into the method, checking the output. Um, we do need some web tests, so we'll actually boot up Drupal and check that the things are actually working. So we're going to need the setup method for that. In this case, we're going to create a user, and the user can create articles and pages. And then we're going to log that user in, so I'm just messing these together rather than separating that into the variables. We'll start off by using variable set. So the way that this currently works um, is we pass an array. As a, as, a, as a variable in the variables table, of which content types we want to be affected by it. So, and in our client implementation, there's only a need for one particular content type. So, you have the option there. Um, so, we can do that using variable set, as you would do normally. And there's other little helper methods in terms of refresh variables that clears out some caches and things behind the scenes. So, we're saying we're only going to affect articles. Um, so we're going to assert the first assertion. Okay, so we've actually written a custom assertion in this case. So rather than having to rewrite the same test several times, again, don't repeat yourself idea, we're going to wrap this in a, a custom assertion. So again, it's just a method on the test class again. This one's private. Um, we're just calling it assert. In this case, tag fields are not hidden. Uh, and that's just a wrapper around assert field by name. Um, we're going to pass it the field tags and have to include the script brackets for the language. Um, so the width is undefined. Um, we expect that to be null. And in this case, we are passing uh, a particular message back. So when we view the list of results, we see our own particular message. We will see field tags visible rather than field, yeah, the actual so random automatically generated string. Um, so then we'll see the the same thing, essentially different um, string fields. And essentially, what we can do is use a method called Drupal get. So Drupal get performs a get request. So essentially, clicks a button or loads a page as if you type it into the URL. So in this case, because we've got permissions to view, uh, permissions to create articles, we can see this page. So we could have done an assert response here to check it was a 200, but we don't need to do that in this case. And we're just going to run, in this case, our three custom assertions. So you want to check that the button is found. You want to check the button is not found. Oh, hide option fields are not found. Um, so there's two buttons. The button changes depending on whether or not you've got it visible or not. So you'll say show optional fields, hide optional fields, depending on obviously what state you're in. Um, we also then want to assert that the, field, the tag field is hidden. Uh, and then what we also want to do is do a post request um, so essentially, click that button uh, and then do the same thing. So we're testing both sides, both sides of the coin, essentially. And yeah, so in this case, Drupal post, you give it the path that you want to go to, which is load that article, pass in the data through, in which case we don't need to give it any, and then essentially give it a title of something to click. So our button is show optional fields. Um, this is our output. So all green, yay. Um, 
this was actually run, let's see, 68 passes, including the ones that extended from the base pass. And these have run in about 24 seconds. So a bit more than zero seconds that each has had to keep in mind it's storing Drupal potentially behind this one. Um, and running tests against it. Again, more things. You can see that with the uh, last two there, has optional fields that are not found. That's, again, a custom method that we pass through. Rather than just saying something something is false, this, this allows us to put a bit more descriptive method in. Um, so a few takeaways. Um, I think it's fair to say that testing can boost better quality code. There have been a few times where I've written a module on maybe on work time, and everything was fine. And then when I've maybe written some tests on personal time, found that maybe I've given the wrong permission or I've written access uh, administered nodes rather than administered content or vice versa. I can never remember which one was the right one. Um, again, yeah, writing tests is an investment. So rather than saying that you don't have time or don't have a budget to do this, trying to come to that mindset of spending a small amount of time now potentially can save a long a large amount of time in the future. Um, and it's okay to start small and then you don't have to start with test driven development. You don't have to start writing tests first and then write code. Um, in this case, I've been working on sites and I've been doing fixing a bug. And just for the sake of fixing that bug, write a test to make sure that bug doesn't come back. Start off with one or two small tests and slowly build the test, the test suite over time. Um, just going to do a quick plug with Drupal Camp Bristol again. So we're third year for Drupal Camp Bristol this year in. Um, three years of June to second of July, business day, sprints, and sessions. Um, any questions? Yes. So just um, um, what you just said was true. Uh, I think that if I can work more, I can be working on my CSS too. And I can now you know, write tests. And that test starts to solve some bugs that I never, never thought about before. And yeah. like it's really nice. But then it's very important to do. Yeah, I've, I've had the same thing. So I was writing a module, there may be one called Copyright Block, is one of the ones that I maintain, and wrote it all, and it worked fine, <laughs> and then tried to write the test for it, and then hit the same error, essentially saying your configuration schema is not valid or something to that effect. But Whereas it, it, completely, it completely worked. Like for me, using the module, testing the module, it worked perfectly. So I've, I've hit the same problem. and. I'm not entire, I've not got my head completely around the configuration schema and stuff in Drupal yet, and I think that's maybe where the, the problem is. And I can quite happily build stuff on the front end of the site, but how does that model define in that config file in order for it to match? Yeah. I haven't quite got that bit around yet, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think again, maybe if that's the case, if, if we go in the TDD approach, <coughs> then maybe like, you probably hit that error sooner rather than writing the whole module and then finding the error at the end. So that's if we can yeah, bring the error to the surface sooner, to fix them rather than breaking them. Yeah. Um, you looked at modules three basic that you use so you can't do for a person. So you have got a, uh, a local slash data and you manage it. Yeah, to a degree. So I was doing something quite recently um, and it was sent to the the result was we were trying to create nodes in Drupal, essentially. And the client was given an XML feed, quite a long XML feed of data, and we had to pass that and then create nodes out of it, essentially. Um, so that I did in a test driven <coughs> way because I wanted to assume that the, the data that I was given was being A, the nodes were being created, and B, um, the fields were being mapped correctly. So in certain, in certain situations, field on the XML field A and B were concatenated to make C. And that, that type <coughs> of thing. So there was a unit, I did that with a unit test based approach or functional test approach. Um, in that situation, rather than relying on A and external URLs to be visible and having I don't know, 
types of nodes or whatever it was at, at the particular time, I named um, a subset of that, so a smaller XML file essentially, maybe it was two or three, and then it was property listing type, so probably also one, two, three, like street, Simpsons reference. Um, and then just because I knew what the data was going into it, I could then assert the right of looking out. So I could say that, yeah, given I know that it's going to be one, two, three, fake street, the node then on the other side, the title has to be, I could use a cert title to then say, one, two, three, fake street. So the advantage of that where I could actually test it, so essentially you're sort of mocking or studying the data. And there's a slight way, so when I, there's a function within the module code itself that said something like import nodes from XML. And that optionally took an XML argument which all, there was an option there, but it was null by default. And then if that was null, it went to the API. But if it wasn't null, it didn't, because it already had the XML. So within the test, I could just say, get the XML from this file, do um, file load contents or whatever, and pass that, and then give that to the file. So there's slight changes to where I had to write the code for it to work. But the advantages were, again, didn't need to actually write another third party service to run. I run the test locally, I'm in full control of the data that I'm testing against, so it's not going to change. Um, and yeah, I could do it within two, three, five nodes rather than thousands. <laughs> there we go. So it means I could run those tests quickly, within, in this case, maybe a few minutes. But what it meant was when we then gave it to the client and ran it on its production server and got, uh, again, a thousand, let's say, nodes through, I'm confident that my mapping has worked and right, it's going to the right field. and. A and B would be carried to make C and, and everything else. So, did that answer your question? It does, yeah. Awesome. The problem here is the integration from the manager data. Yeah, again, we're talking a little bit about mocks and stubs there again, so it's sort of similar. But I, I think in PHP that's a little bit easier. But in this case, it was, if you're doing dependency injection, well, that's a similar.